Welcome to the Harold B. Lee Library's House of Learning Lecture Series. I'm Mike Hunter, the coordinator for this year's lecture series. In the Doctrine and Covenants section 88 verse 119, it says, organize yourselves and, and establish a house, even a house of faith, a house of learning. The Harold B. Lee Library seeks to establish a house of learning by bringing together scholars and students for discussion of ideas. Today we are privileged to have as our featured speaker Professor Rachel Crook Lyon from BYU's Department of Counseling, Psychology, and Special Education. Professor Crook Lyon obtained a bachelor's degree in psychology from BYU and a master's degree and doctorate in counseling psychology from the University of Maryland College Park. She has published numerous articles and book chapters in the field of counseling psychology with an emphasis in her research on dreams, an interest she has had since taking a seminar on the subject as an undergraduate. She will share some of her research with us today in describing the potential benefits of exploring our dreams. Her lecture is entitled, The Royal Road Revisited, Working with Dreams. Please join with me in welcoming Rachel. Thank you. Before I start, I would just like to um, say how grateful I am to be here, and I also want to acknowledge um, the help of Stephanie Deverage, my in, uh, research assistant, in preparing this PowerPoint presentation, as well as others for their helpful comments and feedback. Okay, give me a start. Okay. Okay. So imagine if you had this dream. I dreamed that I got a letter summoning me to this courthouse. The 12 apostles were judging us, me and the people in the room, and the first presidency was presiding and reading off the sins of each person. After they were read, the chair would be kicked out from underneath them, and they would hang to death because 12 of us were sitting there with nooses around our necks. I was so upset and felt such an injustice, but I was the only one objecting. The sins that were being read off about the people before me were small things like being unkind to someone. I wiggled my way out of the noose and fled the courtroom and said, we don't have to die for our sins. Jesus already died for us. They didn't know what I was talking about. Basically, I went to a world where Jesus never died for us. Okay, so if you had that dream, you might be feeling a little bit confused, disturbed, you might be interested in trying to find out a little bit more about what that dream might mean for you. The title of my presentation is The Royal Road Revisited, Working with Dreams. And this refers, the royal road refers to Sigmund Freud's conceptualization of dreams as the royal road to the unconscious, a way to find out what was really bothering a person. Although working with dreams was a major part of therapy in the early part of the century with psychoanalytic theorists like Freud and Jung, it seemed to fall in disfavor and wasn't used very much by theorists from other, therapists from other theoretical orientations, perhaps because dream interpretation was considered to be unscientific, time-consuming, or irrelevant. In the last 20 years or so, there's been a resurgence of interest in dreams as a useful clinical tool. Throughout this presentation, we will revisit this royal road, taking a look at popular culture's slant on dreams, how dreams have been perceived throughout history from different cultural and religious groups, as well as some examples of famous dreams. I will then present some research I've conducted looking at therapists and clients' experiences with dreams, and we'll walk through a model of how to understand dreams. So when we look at what popular culture thinks of dreams, here you can see a cartoon of a man dreaming that he's flying. Over here is a bird dreaming that he is swimming and a fish dreaming that he's walking or running. So one way to look at dreams is that you can do things in dreams that you can't do in waking life, as evidenced by this cartoon. Here's another cartoon. Here's a bird on an analyst's couch saying, I dreamt about you again last night. You are a big bronze statue. So another popular culture view of dreams is that dreams might reflect how we're really feeling about someone. In this case, maybe some hostility or, or anger towards the analyst. If we look at some different cultural views on dreaming, from ancient Egypt, 
The ancient Egyptians believed that dreams were a mean for the gods to speak to the mortals. And dream interpreters lived in temples and often felt they had a mandate from the gods to provide interpretations. In ancient Chinese culture, they, the Chinese believed that the spirit holds the dreams and separates itself from the body in the night to communicate with dead spirits. They believed that if you interrupted another's dreaming state, that was dangerous. In terms of Hebrew beliefs, the Hebrews believed that God gave, God gave guidance through dreams and prophets were able to interpret rulers' dreams as in the case of Joseph with Pharaoh's dream or Daniel with King Nebuchadnezzar. So dreams were meant to be interpreted, to, looked at, to be looked at. And finally, in terms of ancient Indian beliefs, how a person reacts in their own dream is important. So fighting back is a successful aspect, whereas passivity was an ill omen. If we look a little bit more about religion than dream in scriptures, in the LDS faith, there are accounts of dreams in both the Bible and the Book of Mormon. In fact, in the Bible, there are 121 times dreams are mentioned. If we look at some examples, here's Joseph being given direction from the Lord. Now, he, Joseph was in a kind of a perplexed, confused state about the situation with his fiance, his espoused wife, being great with child. Matthew chapter 1, verse 20. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. Another example is Pontius Pilate being warned by his wife's dream, Matthew chapter 27, 19. When he was set down on the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him, saying, Have thou nothing to do with that just man? For I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. And from Job, we have a very poetic look at dreams. Job's definition of a dream, Job 33, 15. In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falleth upon men, in slumberings upon the bed. So another way of looking at dreams. We also have some artist depictions of dreams, often with ethereal figures above the dreamer. So here we have a dream, the dreamer, and then we have these figures above the dreamer. On the next one, a dream of a girl before a sunrise, you can see some different um, it's a little bit dark maybe, but you can see there's some figures above the dreamer trying to try to depict what it's like to have a dream. And then in Queen Catherine's dream, again, you can see swirling figures above, above the dreamer. So now let's take a look about some famous dreams. And another way dreams have been utilized or viewed is a method of problem solving. In these two examples, a scientist and an inventor had been struggling over a problem that they felt was solved through their dreams. First is the structure of the benzene molecule. Friedrich A. von Kekulé had a dream helping him figure out the structure of the benzene molecule. His dream was of atoms moving around before his eyes and coming together in different patterns. The atoms soon came together in long rows and then twisted like a snake. The snake of Adams took its own tail and then twirled in a circle. And when he woke up, he realized that that was the structure of the benzene molecule. It was in a circle. And so having troubled over that dream, uh, having troubled over this problem, then he was able to come to a meaning, or he felt like he was able to solve the, the meaning, the problem with his dream. Another example, this is an inventor, Elias Howe had been working unsuccessfully for years to perfect a lock stitch sewing machine, but he was using a needle threaded through the middle of the shank. He experienced a nightmare in which he was going to be boiled in a pot by a group of cannibals when he became fascinated by their spears, by their spears which had eye-shaped holes near the tip. After waking from this pot boiler, he whittled a model of the dream spear what, with a hole located at the tip and thereby discovered the detail he required for his sewing machine to work satisfactorily. Another, and different authors have had um, various ways of looking at dreams. This is from the Talmud, Rabbi Chizda said, a dream which is not interpreted is like a letter which is not read. Who could resist receiving a letter and not opening it up or reading it? 
From another perspective, this is from the poet Shelley. We rest, a dream has power to poison sleep. We rise, one wandering thought pollutes the day. Maybe you've had a dream or the experience where something from your dream has kind of affected you throughout that day. You've maybe felt a little uncomfortable or uneasy or disturbed by it. So why work with dreams? Well, there are several reasons why we might want to work with dreams. One reason is that people often have troubling dreams that influence their waking lives. As Shelley wrote, one wandering thought pollutes the day. Dreams can have an impact on waking life. Conversely, waking life events can impact dreams. Research on trauma survivors indicates that survivors may have nightmares about the traumatic event. Similarly, anxious clients often have dreams about anxiety-provoking situations. Finally, working with dreams can be a means of navigating around clients' defenses and quickly getting to their core issues, a kind of backdoor to deeper issues. In this way, dreams, dream work can be a helpful component in brief psychotherapy when you don't have maybe too much time to focus on things, but if you can get quickly to what might be bothering a person. So I'm gonna now share some, um, some of the results from studies that I've conducted. And this first looked at therapist experiences in working with dreams. I conducted a study looking at 129 therapist experiences and dreams. And the first finding we found is that almost all therapists, 92%, had worked with dreams in psychotherapy, at least occasionally. They reported that clients had brought dreams in and they had listened to them. In terms of who was more likely to work with dreams, clinicians were more likely to work with dreams when they had more training in dream work. They had had some model or some exposure to training that they, so that they could feel like they could work with a client's dream. Also, therapists who had higher estimated dream recall, it means they could remember their dreams. They reported that they could remember their dreams, were more likely to work with dreams and they had more positive attitudes towards dreams. They thought dreams were a valuable way of looking at, of looking at problems or issues. And also, cl clinicians who had done more personal dream work, had thought about their own dreams, were more likely to work with dreams than cl clinicians who hadn't. One may speculate that therapists who feel that their dreams are valuable and have benefited from exploring their own dreams are more confident that focusing on dreams can be helpful to clients. So who do they work with? What kind of clients are they likely to work with? We found that therapists work on dreams with clients who have troubling dreams or recurrent dreams, have nightmares, or who have a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder. They also tend to work on dreams with clients who are interested in working with dreams. They are unlikely to work on, on dreams with clients who have schizophrenia or psychosis. So some of the implications, it's that it seems that therapists are most willing to work on dreams when clients seem interested in it or when it's a, it's a problem. And they are unwilling to work on, dr clients with, on dreams with clients whose perceptions of reality are distorted and thus maybe have a difficulty distinguishing between waking life and dreaming events. So now looking at the client's experiences with dreams. In terms of client factors, this is another study we did looking at clients' experiences. Clients who had discussed dreams in therapy had more positive attitudes towards dreams. They remembered their dreams more often, and they had more encouragement from their therapist to work with dreams. Another finding of the study was that Clients generally found the dream activities that their therapist had done to be helpful, whether it was simply listening to them or doing some more extensive work, developing an action plan based on the dream. With respect to the outcome of the dream session, this was positively related to therapist encouragement of dream work. So therapists seem to have some influence on whether clients, first of all, brought dreams to therapy in the first place, and second of all, profited from the dream interpretation. If clients know that therapists appreciate and value dreams, they may be more likely to bring dreams in and then work hard to make meaning out of the dream. Clients who had not discussed dreams in therapy indicated that they hadn't 
part of the reason was that there simply wasn't enough time in therapy, in session, to work on dreams they felt, or it had never occurred them, to them to bring in a dream. So they didn't know that it was maybe a possibility that they could work on a dream with their therapist. This is another study I did looking at spirituality and dream work. And the purpose of this study was to document how some clients and counselors focus on spirituality and dreams. This was, um, this was a nationwide sample of clients, so the dreams that I'm going to be presenting are of clients from a variety of religious and spiritual perspectives. So from a larger sample, we determined that about 20 clients reported spiritual or religious images in the dreams, identified the dream as having a spiritual or religious meaning, or indicated that the counselor related the dream to their spiritual beliefs. And we were interested in looking at both the therapist and client con contributions in linking spirituality and dream work. Our qualitative analysis revealed three main themes. One theme we found is that some spiritually minded clients believe their dreams came from a sacred source, a sacred or spiritual source. A second theme was that clients in either individually or collaboratively with their counselor constructed a meaning for the dream that related to their spiritual life and beliefs. It may have represented their conflicts or concerns about religion. It may have been a reflection of their strength and faith or their spiritual search. A final feature of spirituality and dreams in the sample was that several clients interpreted their dream as a message of guidance or preparation for the future. And now I'd like to look at several examples of these themes, as well as how some client and therapist factors either facilitated or in some cases inhibited the integration of spirituality with dream work. First, dreams from a sacred source. The, and these are all pseudonyms. So Steve uh, was a 26-year-old white male client who had worked with his counselor for five months before he brought this dream into session. He said that he hadn't had any encouragement for, from his counselor for bringing in a dream, but he wanted to discuss this dream that he thought was an answer to his prayers. I dreamed of a girl. I was to marry her. I prayed for the dream. Then the marriage didn't happen. I mentioned this as a source of frustration to my therapist. She suggested that I needed to allow myself to get angry at God and trust that he wouldn't abandon me. Steve believed that this dream was a message from God, and so he was frustrated and confused when the desired outcome didn't happen. After discussing this dream with his therapist, the client noted, the dream was true, life is true. I guess they don't always match. A heads up isn't a guarantee. Steve further acknowledged that the responsibility of finding a meaning of the dream rested with him and that he needed some resolution. He wrote, I changed my life a little by not allowing a frustrated dream to affect me. I also decided to be open with my feelings to God. Taking a look at another example, this is some spiritual concerns reflected in dreams. This is Frances's dream. And she was a 39-year-old white female who had worked with her counselor for about four months before she brought this dream. She wrote, this is the only dream of a religious nature that I ever remember having in my life. Usually they are not religious in any way. I dreamt that I witnessed the crucifixion of Jesus, but it was in a barn or manger that he was nailed to a cross. There was fire beneath him. I woke up in the middle of the dream crying or rather wailing. She goes on to say, my interpretation of the dream is that my 73-year-old mother has a spinal disease, is now unable to walk, and is in pain 24 hours a day, seven days a week. This has been going on for years. I believe that I have felt that nothing could be worse than crucifixion. Yet what I have witnessed from with my mother's ailing health and pain, I don't believe it anymore. I was very concerned for her at the time of the dream. So during the discussion of this dream with her counselor, Frances reported that her counselor suggested that perhaps her sense of spirituality was dying. She felt that this really related well to her spiritual beliefs and the dream. As a result of working on this dream and counseling, the client made an effort to look at why she might be dying spiritually and to discuss some spiritual conflicts. Frances noted that she was glad she had attended this session with her therapist, but she was also a little disappointed that her counselor did not seem to encourage more dream work. 
Francis wrote, my therapist said she has worked with dreams, sounded as though she may have had a lot of experience, yet we've only discussed two dreams during the same session. She doesn't ask me about them in general. She further noted, Francis further noted, that she wished she had brought more dreams into session with her counselor. Here's another example of spiritual concerns from Bruce. Um, he was a tw he's a 22-year-old white male client and reported that he had seen his therapist for about 10 months and had brought two previous dreams into counseling. And his therapist had encouraged him to work with dreams, bring in a dream. Here's Bruce's dream. I was walking in the city with my very first girlfriend toward a cathedral. Inside it were a desk and a nun and a priest at the desk. The girl ran to them and asked for the yellow pages for the listing of local parishes. She said, I must speak to God. There are issues that demand her attention. I said, how do you know there is a God? The three other people were taken aback. My girl said, it's an unquestionable fact. I looked squarely at the priest and said, tell me one thing that will prove beyond any doubt that there is a God. The priest thought hard and simply said, he is. And he began laughing hysterically. And the last thing I remember before I was jolted awake was his teeth. In this example, the client seemed to be very interested in dreams. And he believed dreams were very important and valuable ways to understand himself. He recalled dreaming just about every day and had worked extensively on his dreams. This is the meaning that he made of this dream after working with his counselor. He said, the priest's teeth remain the most critical symbol because when I saw them, they were like a child's teeth. Not bad and unkempt, just underdeveloped. And that's because when you're a child, you don't question religion in any way. During the counseling session, Bruce indicated that some of the helpful activities that his therapist had conducted were to relate the dreams to his spiritual life and help him come to his own interpretation of the dream. Furthermore, Bruce reported that he was discovered all of the meaning of the dream from talking about it with his counselor, and he was glad he had attended the session. The final theme was looking at dreams as a message of guidance. Rosalio is a 48-year-old Latina female who had a nightmare about her son that she brought into session with her counselor. My 21-year-old son was found with syringes in a box under the seat of a car. I remember feeling so afraid for him, something very wrong, feeling so troubled. This was a recurrent dream for Rosalia, the first one she had discussed with her counselor. Two days after she had the nightmare, her son was arrested for drug possession, and she began the process of seeking an attorney. She wondered whether this dream was mother's intuition and a warning of impending danger for her son hanging out with the wrong friends. After working on this dream with her counselor, Rosalia didn't report any additional gains or insights from the dream. In fact, she noted that she hadn't discovered any of the meaning of the dream from talking about it with her counselor perhaps because they only spent about five minutes on the dream in session. Another factor may have been Rosalia's perception of her own counselor's lack of interest in dreams. Rosalia said, I'm interested in focusing on dreams, but I'm not sure about my counselor's interest. I don't know if my therapist would find dreams important. I think it's important to discuss dreams and opportunity, and especially recurring ones. Discussion may assist in uncovering deep hidden emotions. So you can see that people made different, had different ways of organizing or trying to integrate their religion and spiritual beliefs with their dream. Most of the clients in this sample who reported few gains in, from working on a dream with their counselor also found that their counselor hadn't spent much time in the session. Furthermore, several clients mentioned that they wished they had had more time and had spent more opportunities to discuss dreams with their counselor. So thus far, I've, um, the research I've presented includes therapists and clients' experiences with dreams without particular um, res attention to a specific model. I will now describe one particular model, the cognitive experiential model of dream work, and go through several dream examples using this model to show you how it works. Just to give you a little uh, empirical grounding for the model, 
There have been over 20 studies on this particular model of cognitive experiential, the cognitive experiential model of dream work, and it's been found to be effective in a variety of treatment modalities, including single sessions, brief individual therapy, group therapy, and couples therapy. A consistent finding across studies is that clients' positive attitudes towards dreams predicts outcome. So if clients believe it's beneficial, valuable to look at dreams, they'll benefit from working on their dreams. Also, dream work leads to positive session outcomes. Um, the studies have shown that dream work leads to more client insight, to a greater depth of the session, as well as an increased therapeutic relationship compared to regular therapy sessions. So it seems that dream work can, there's something about working on a dream with a, a counselor and client that they are able to strengthen that therapeutic relationship. So what are the assumptions of the cognitive experiential model of dreams? One assumption is that dreams reflect waking life. So what people are concerned about and are thinking about is reflected in their dreams. Another assumption is that the meaning of dreams is personal. So that if I have an image of a dog in my dream, for example, the meaning that would be very different for me because of my own associations, memories, experiences with dogs as compared to another person. So we don't use a dream dictionary um, in this model, which you would, might be able to say, oh, well, this is what the image means for you. Instead, the meaning of the images in dreams is personal. A third assumption is that the process of working on a client's dream should be collaborative in that the therapist facilitates the exploration for the dreamer. So the therapists are not the experts on what the dream means, but they are experts on the process of asking questions, of facilitating insight. A final assumption is that because dreams involve cognitive, emotional, and behavioral components, Dream work also should target those areas about cognition, emotions, and actions. Now I'll give you an overview of the stages of the model. The first stage is exploration. The goal of the exploration stage is to probe into the experiences, memories, thoughts, and feelings that propel the dream. After the exploration stage, the therapist and the client work together to understand the meaning of the dream in the insight stage. And then in the action stage, the therapist helps the client translate insights gained from the work, working in the dream into exploring changes in waking life. And we'll go through each of these, each of these stages. First, the exploration stage. The first step is I, I ask a client, tell me the dream right now, as if you are experiencing it right now in the first person present tense. As a dream facilitator, even though the, the dream may seem bizarre or disturbing, just maintain a non-judgmental stance. We're working through it together, trying to figure out what the dream might mean for the dreamer. Also, you don't have to know the meaning of the dream immediately. That's part of the reason why we're going through these stages. And then finally, you sequentially explore about five to 10 images in the dream. And I usually will jot down the images as the dreamer is telling it. Um, horse, walking, sky, something, um, things like that. In terms of how you explore these images, on the next slide, there's an acronym DRAW. The D is description. So this is where I ask the client to describe the image in a little greater detail. Paint the picture, paint a picture of the image for me verbally. What does the dog look like? What kind of collar is the dog wearing? The R is re-experiencing. How are you feeling at this moment in the dream about this image? A is associations. What is a dog? What's the first thing that comes to mind when you think of a dog? What memories do you have of dogs? Sometimes I might say, I'm from Mars. We don't have dogs there, so what's a dog? Or I might ask about the function. What's a function of a door or a house? To help them get, to help them think about what the dream might mean for them. The fourth step is to ask for waking life triggers of each dream image. What's going on in your life right now that reminds you of this image or that might have triggered this image in your dream? So let's take a look at a couple of examples. Um, the first example is Shirley's dream. 
Shirley was a woman that I worked with um, who was in an assisted living facility, an elderly woman. Here's her dream. My daughter comes to pick me up, but I'm not ready. We talk for a long time on either side of a fence. So the image we're gonna look at and go through the exploration is of a fence. Surely, in terms of the description of the fence in the dream, it's just a regular wire fence. Feelings at this point in the dream, lonely. My daughter is always on the other side of the fence. Associations to fence, to fences. Fences are something to protect you from the elements and from people. In terms of waking life triggers, I've always had fenced in yards. So what I did with Shirley is go through the different images in the dream using, the, using these four steps. Another example, this is Lance, who is a student here at BYU. I'm in a room with lots of windows on the wall and ceiling. The windows are protecting me from a horrible red cloud that is outside. We explored one image in, in the dream, um, windows. In terms of how Lance described the windows, some are thick and strong, some are thin and weak. Feelings for Lance, I feel scared that the thin ones will break. Associations, a window protects, but also allows you to see what you are protected from. A waking life trigger, my family is going through some very difficult trials. The window might be my only protection as I watch. After, after going through the stage, after going through the exploration stage, I often will summarize the dream for the client and insert their descriptions, feelings, associations, and waking life triggers. And then we move on to the insight stage. First, I'll ask the dreamer, what do you think the dream means now? This respects what the client thinks, allows the client to integrate information or, or insight gained from the exploration stage. I also listen for what parts are left out. Maybe they're not attending to a part of the dream, and so I might want to follow up with them on that. Then, together, the dreamer and the facilitator collaborate to, collaborate to construct an understanding of the dream that fits for the client. On one of several levels of insight. So, the different levels of insight you can look at. One common way of looking at dream images is as though they reflect waking life concerns. What's going on in my life not right now that triggered this dream? In approaching dreams as reflecting waking life, it's important to remember that dream images can be metaphors for feelings. So the images of cabinets floating in the air, for example, may reflect the dreamer's feelings of uncertainty or lack of grounding in making an important decision. Likewise, the inability to find a room in which one is to take a final exam. I don't know if anyone has had that. That's kind of a common image and can be a common image in dreams. So the inability to find a room in which one is to take a final exam may reflect the dreamer's concerns about being evaluated in his or her present occupation. I always think it's interesting for myself when I have anxiety dreams in my current life, the, the, the time I go back to is a school-related dream. It's an anxiety dream related around school issues, which makes me more empathic, I think, and sympathetic for students right now. If that's, the, if that's where we go back to when we're feeling anxious and nervous, imagine how they're feeling right now. Um, so in addition to current concerns, the waking life level can also um, reflect concerns or issues about anticipating future events or looking at past events. In this approach, um, waking life triggers from the exploration stage can be particularly helpful. Finding out, okay, what are the triggers that are going on in waking life for finding meaning in the dream. Another way of looking at dreams is to think of each dream image as representing part of yourself. So if I have a dream in which I'm being strangled, I would wonder, is there a part of me that is strangling another part? Is there a part of me that is not allowing that part to flourish or grow? I had a dream just after the birth of my first child um, in which I had this tiny little baby in my dream and I wrapped the little baby in a tortilla and I ate it. And I remember thinking, tastes like chicken. That's what, that was the image, that was the, and so I woke up and I'm horrified. This is, you know, not a very good dream for a new mother to have and I think, oh my gosh, I want to eat my baby, you know, this is, this is very horrible. Fortunately, I had had training in dream work and so I thought about what the, you know, what the dream might mean for me. 
And when I thought about the act of eating, I thought of consuming. That was, that was the association I made. And then I realized I was being consumed by this new role of being a mother. I was being consumed by this experience. And that the little baby represented the, the new mother part of me that was not very, not very strong or not very developed. I felt like I was being consumed. And so then the dream didn't seem so horrible or scary and, and actually helped me understand my own experience. Another way of looking at dreams is as an experience in and of itself. So what is it like to go through that experience in the dream? As an example, I had a client who was expecting her first baby and she brought in a dream about giving birth. As a result of having that dream, of going through the delivery in the dream, she felt confident that she could do it in waking life. And so from this perspective, the dream isn't really interpreted. Rather, it's just trying to find out what is the experience like for the dreamer? What was it like to solve the world's problems or to attend your own funeral or to, to be a secret agent? Another level of looking at dreams is from a spiritual perspective. So this is looking at the dream as representing the dreamer's relationship with a higher power or the dreamer's concerns about existential issues like the meaning of life, death, isolation. I had a client who presented a dream in which she was playing the organ, but wasn't able to play any louder no matter how hard she pressed on the keys. Through the use of a spiritual approach to dreams, she began to feel that by relying on her own understanding and power, she wasn't able to appreciate life fully. She wasn't able to play louder the way she wanted to and needed assistance from a higher power. So let's take a look back at Shirley and Lance. Here's Shirley's insight. It was from more of a waking life perspective. Shirley says, I'm not happy living like this in an assisted living facility, but I'm not ready to jump the fence. I'm on one side of the fence and life is on the other side. Lance's insight was from more of a spiritual perspective. The windows represent my testimony of the gospel. Some parts are strong and some are weak. My testimony is my defense against the evils of the world. When a part of it is weak, I become more vulnerable to the influences of the world. So after having gone through the exploration and insight, we then move into the action stage. The purpose of the action stage is to help the clients carry over what they've learned in the exploration and insight stages into thinking about changes they might want to make in their waking life. I begin the action stage by asking the client, how would you change the dream? If you could change the dream, how would you change it and why? The idea behind this question is that because the dreamer initially created the dream, he or she can change it as well. By taking responsibility for making changes in the dream, the clients may begin thinking about taking responsibilities in their waking life. Asking the clients to change the dream in fantasy it's kind of a precursor or warm up to the next step of the action stage, which is bridging changes in the dream to changes in the client's waking life. So if, if I were to be, if one part of me was to be strangled by another part, I might think about how I could nourish that part of myself or allow that part to grow and what changes I would need to make in my waking life to do that. Another possible change in waking life is for the client to honor the dream or the work on the dream using some kind of ritual or symbol. Rituals that some clients have used include the following. A client purchased a picture of whales to remind her of her own gentle nature and whales was an image in the dream. Or a client built a quiet spot in her garden like a spot she had seen in her dream. Another way to continue working with dreams is to write the dream down to continue thinking about the insights you've gained in working on the dream and to keep a dream journal. So let's take a look at what Shirley would do, Shirley's action. She said, I would change the dream by being ready when my daughter came to get me. And the fence would be there because I like my privacy, not because I can't get out. And so as a therapist, I would also explore with, with Shirley, well, how might that translate to changes in waking life then? If this is how you would change the dream, then how would that translate to changes in your waking life? Lance's action. I would change the windows to be stronger so that the evil cloud would not leak through. And how that might translate into waking life? 
I think I need to strengthen my testimony so that I can have stronger defenses against trials and temptations. So some concluding thoughts. Dreams have fascinated people throughout the ages and different cultural and religious groups have used various means to make sense of dreams. I've presented one model of working with dreams that has been shown to be effective in helping clients gain insight and improve work in therapy. Now a caveat. Uh, I don't think that every dream has meaning necessarily or that it's important to consider every dream that you have. You probably have dreams that you'd like to forget. I know I do as well. But I do argue that if a dreamer is confused or troubled by a dream or wants to work on a dream, then working with dreams can be a useful clinical tool. A final thought from Montaigne. I believe that dreams are true interpreters of our inclinations, but there is art required to sort and understand them. Thank you. Thank you.